Hello, this is Janet Gallen welcoming you to Love Letters Live. Today's guest is Gordon Goodwin. And Gordon, I'm going to go right to you. You know, usually I like to introduce our guests, mm -hmm. but the truth is, from what I've read about you and know about you, your reach is so broad and so wide and so huge that I'm going to let you start because I know you span so many areas. I, I don't know how that could possibly be. But oh, I don't know how it could be either. But it's some easy. people, some people do express <laughs> they characterize it that way somehow. But you know, for me, I just have doing what I've done since I was probably in kindergarten. How old? Kindergarten. Oh, I was going to ask you that. Okay. So I just I just started writing music in, in, when I was kinder, kindergarten age, uh -huh. and then kept it going. And and but it, uh, probably about eighth or ninth grade, I realized that maybe I had a, a unique skill that not everybody had, and maybe that was my connection to the world. Maybe that was kind of who I would hang my identity on. I knew I didn't, I, I was like a clunky, geeky band geek. You know, I had no athletic skills. I was shy and a little awkward. So um, music seemed to be the ticket for me. Well, I have a question about that when you said, you know, doing what just came. I, I have always had a feeling with certain people that we have our throwaway talents. That is those things that come so easily to us that we kind of pay them no mind at some point, yet to others, they're huge. Mm -hmm. In my case, um, it wasn't exactly a throwaway situation. Um, I, I think I had a feel for it, but I, I didn't have um, much discipline. Oh, I was going to ask. Yes. But that, fact, that's a separate thing. Yes, it is. But for, as a kindergarten kid, I didn't want to take piano lessons, but mom and dad said, that's what you're going to do. Really good for them. I, yeah, I, I, well, it led to it. They gave me my life by that right. because did you, did you start out musically as a pianist first? A little kid playing my scales in my hand and exercises, but my teacher, she was smart and she saw that I had a problem. I didn't like practicing. I, I remember the kids in the neighborhood would make fun of me. How come you're not out playing? Because I'd be in there, do, 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 you know, and so that I took some heat from the other kids. And that, you know, how that feels when you're a little kid. But my, my piano teacher, Mrs. Hodges, said, if you practice your scales, I will let you write a song next week. Oh. And I'm like, well, what does that even mean? Write a song? I don't know. What is she goes, you're going to like it. And so she taught me kind of the opening steps of how do I create my own music. Now, I wasn't a young Mozart. They weren't really noteworthy, except for the fact that I was doing them at all. And, and it put it in my head early that maybe I could create music as opposed to just parroting back other people's stuff. So it, it's, it did start pretty early. And I was lucky that Janet Hodges, you know, kind of opened the door and nudged me through it. You know, that, that is really the mark of a brilliant teacher, isn't it? To see mm. what the student needs. What the specific student needs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Find a way to connect with them. And yeah, and she, she definitely knew how to do that. So, so for me, I have to say, to answer your question, though, in fullness, um, it took me probably till age 25 before I slowed down and corrected some fundamental, uh, mis there weren't mistakes, they were omissions in my training. Like I got a gig with Johnny Mathis when I was 25 <laughs> and I was, I was playing piano for him. I later on would conduct for him, but I was playing piano and a lot of it was kind of concert style stuff. And my wrist, my right wrist would get really sore. And I go, oh, man, I'm not going to, I'm not, they're going to fire me if I can't do this. So I studied piano with a guy at UCLA and he said, man, there's so much you're doing wrong. Oh. And first thing you're not doing is you're not breathing. You're I said, I'm not. He goes, no, he goes, here's, here's you. You get to a hard thing and you go. Oh, I was going to say, were you gasping instead of I breathing? was holding my breath. Now I've been playing saxophone since I was in eighth grade. So you think that I would understand about that. But for some reason I got on the piano and I, I didn't give my body the oxygen it needed. So he, he helped me fix that. And then I went back and kind of started to, okay, let me slow down and just make sure that I have a good sound on my saxophone. Just play, you know, they have these things, long tones, where you hold a note and you'll see how long you can hold it with a good, you know, sound and good intonation. And it's really, it's difficult, it's boring, but it, it's, it's like an amazing thing for a wind player. So things like that, I just kind of started to do. And, um, and then uh, that acted as a good foundation for me as then I started to add my inspiration on top of that. I was always inspired, 
but my skill set was underdeveloped, you know? So the whole thing about innate talent, uh-huh. I believe, at least in my case, took me so far, but it didn't get me across the line oh, well, until, sure. until, I, until I went and kind of filled in the, the gaps in my training. And you have to know what to do with it, but could we back up mm-hmm. a good long step? Okay, somewhere between, you know, Mrs. Hodges and P- Hodges, was it? Hodges, yes. We got to get her name out there. Um, Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Hodges and 25, when you were doing something with Jeff, what was in between? What were you doing? Oh. I know that you were doing some interesting stuff, what with Disney and cartoons and what yeah, was- well, well, that that the cartoons came later. Disney came after I got out of college. I, How? Went, to, I went to school. I had a friend who was working there and he goes, Hey, they're hiring piano players. You want to come down and audition? And that showed me right then this is how show business works it's personal relationships yeah i just had a friend he got me in the door and i got the job and i worked as a musician at disneyland for probably 1979 through 1981 but i still work for them to this day i write music for them and i compose for their films and different things so it it became a lifelong uh you know relationship for me and and a and a fruitful one but my friend tom got me in the door how nice to know. Yes. Yeah. And how you've just, you know, in addition to enormous innate talent, you've been lucky. Yeah. You've been lucky with great teachers and a friend who knew. Could you, okay, Johnny Mathis. Mm-hmm. So uh, Johnny Mathis was the sound in 1957, 1950, that every girl needed in her life. Yes. I, all I can tell you is my Sweet 16 party, I got three of his albums because everyone knew that that's, what was that like working with him? Well, uh, it was the greatest gift because he is the most wonderful person. And I was pretty green when I started with him, but he just, it was a first class thing. Like we traveled really well and stayed in places. How did you get chosen for that? I auditioned. I went in and auditioned and they needed a piano player. And then later I moved over to the conductor chair uh-huh. and been conducting and writing arrangements. And we're still friends. And I want to tell you a story about it because uh, I got married last July. Nice. And Johnny, met, we wanted to him to sing at the wedding, but I was, I talked to his office and there was some concern about his memory, you know, and his, and his uh, ability to kind of remember this song in that context, because at this point in his life, he can remember vividly things in the 40s 50s 60s 70s sure. but recent you know the information you know recently won't stick as easily so we thought well maybe he'd be willing to go into the recording studio and and record the song so we sent him the song went to his house he had memorized it we just ran it two times and he was and i told him that that at that at that rehearsal i said you know john you don't know this but to us when you open that your mouth and that sound comes oh, out, I know it's a part of it's a part of our culture. It's yeah. a part of the world's fabric of of uh, all things good. And I go, and you're used to it because you hear it every day. But for the rest of us, it's a freaking miracle. Well, that's it's, that's the kind of thing about a throwaway. You know, things that are normal to you and to the rest of the world. They're well, that yeah, and I, I grant you that absolutely. And and for John, you know, he he is a. Uh, um, it certainly that that voice was innate. And did you know that he was a was like a Olympics uh, level athlete no. as a high jumper? Really? And he was going to the Olympic tryouts. No. And he got a call from his manager who had been booking him little gigs in clubs up in San Francisco. He said, Hey, I actually think I I think Columbia Records might want to sign you for a record deal. You need to get up there. So John said, Olympics, record deal. <laughs> He backed out and went right to the to Columbia Records. Yeah. It's a good, good thing for us that he did. You can only jump for so long. You can sing forever. Well, uh, there it is. Yeah. And you know what? He sounds like, like a 40-year-old man when he uh-huh. sings. He sounds, and we, so my wife Angie and I wrote this song. We played it at the wedding and people were just, you know, just. Of course. <laughs> and so was I actually. And I felt so honored that, you know, that he would agree to do that and, and, uh, um, I'm, I'm lucky to, to, call, to call him a friend. So, so one thing kind of leads to another. And I was, I, I have two questions, if I may. Um, yes, one of them is that big fat band. Mm-hmm. I must say, I was personally 
kind of unaware that big band was still so huge or is it not but you are <laughs> there it is well the big band the big band format has always been logistically and economically difficult even in the 40s oh because of even the number of people that you have is the that number of people so so you got 18 guys in the band and, and even back you know glenn miller tommy dorsey those guys didn't get paid enough money to they lived on the bus it was a hard life you know they play a gig they get in the bus and drive to the next thing yeah. eat breakfast you know crash for a few hours, go to sound check. It was a, it was a rough life. Now I've been able to solve the equation because the guys in my band are, are live in LA and they're uh, session musicians. They work on films and movies and different things. Yeah. So they don't need me to pay them enough money as long as they can still work on the movie. So I've had to just try to balance the schedule. Like we just played the Hollywood bowl last Sunday. I heard that. Yes. And, and so was that a first for you? No, it's our fourth oh. time there. Oh, that's but, what I thought you'd been there. Okay. But I, I have to tell you, you walk out there and you just look up and you just, I get, I allow myself about five seconds just to look up and, and think, how, how did I get here, Gordon? What, what happened, you know? And then, okay, time to work, you know? And so um, that experience is over, over the fullness of time to look back to that little kid who just didn't want to play his scales. Um, that must be. I, I haven't lost my gratitude for it. I and I think, I think that's really important. So I, I have a question about, I, I listened to something that the Big Fat Band did, mm -hmm. and this is kind of a personal observation, and maybe it doesn't even mean anything, but I want to know what you say. I was listening to something that was kind of a standard jazz with, with that energy and tempo yeah. and, and fullness of the band. And yeah. at some point, while I was barely not looking, although I was paying close attention every note, <laughs> it slid into the most heart-wrenching, aching, longing hmm. piece of music that was heavily saxophone. Yeah. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Uh, it could be any number of things, but the-, the That, that broad... sliding from one to the other was just gorgeous. Well, here's the broader point. So what? if you think about Count Basie or uh -huh. Duke Ellington, you know they play swing music. Yes. And they and they define the genre and you know the, uh, we, we idolize them. But- since then, the musicians of my band grew up listening to the Beatles and Stevie Wonder uh -huh. and Count Basie, and they listened to, to Debussy and Tchaikovsky, and they listened to, you know, pop music and all. And so we believe in breaking down the barriers between we all those sure styles. did, and that one piece that was so exquisite. Okay, go yeah. ahead. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's important to me, and I think that that's where it starts. If we can break down musical barriers so we don't say jazz is between here and here, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, classical music is between here and here. If we can just let it all be one big stew, that's the first step for us to be able to do it as human beings and stop identifying by ourselves by our gender or by our race or by our politics or what have you. I, I would like to be judged on the totality of who I am and my, and, and my actions and, you know, and my music as opposed to, um, you know, one specific thing. And I, I, I fear that we are uh, still a ways away from achieving that, you know, in our country. But, but the border, um, the borders I believe in it. Break, the borders are still breaking down more than they used to. They are. They are. Yeah. I think, and I, I think with younger people, especially, that are, have come up. I remember when jazz musicians, when I came up out of college, I was working with older guys. Mm -hmm. and these guys were so threatened by the Beatles. Oh, I don't blame them. <laughs> they were threatened by by rock and roll and by that stuff because it had different values than jazz did. And, right. and without a doubt, rock and roll came over and then wiped jazz off the off the map in terms of its popularity. Right. And so, but I think that we, I think the jazz musicians had a hand in that because look at the pop musicians. They get on stage and they perform and they emote. Yes. And, and they are visually interesting as well as musically. Whereas you see a lot of jazz guys who turn their backs to the audience like Miles did, or a lot of classical musicians who sit up in the orchestra and they look like they'd rather be anywhere else. And this has come home to roost, I think. I think that we need to show the audience at the very least, you don't have to dance around, but you have to show them that you appreciate being there. And that you're having a good time. And that's right. And you're having a good time and you believe in what you're doing and you're conveying your joy to the audience and they will give it back to you if you do yeah. that. Yeah. So, so I, I remember those old guys and remember thinking, well, how could they got, how they get so bitter? And so I think 
the, my generation and then generations, you know, after me have grown up just as a matter of course. Oh, yeah, no, that's all just music. We well, take a oh, of that we take a little of that. That's an advantage, though, for today, because people are um, used to so many different. You know, they didn't have that opportunity in the late 1800s to hear every other kind of music. Right. There you go. So, you know, you pick a discipline. That was kind of it. But also, you know, you hear opera singers doing popular stuff and you see um, Baroque pianists having a good time with ragtime. I mean, right. a lot of people are allowed to appreciate different things without being considered a traitor. Do you, can you imagine what it was like, say in the 1300s and you want to hear music? Oh, you've yeah. got to get in your horse and buggy and you've got to go down to the town square or you've got to get a piano and learn how to play it, which is what people right. did. You had to make an investment in it. Now I pick this up and I just go, boom, music. I know. I know it's, it's it's, and so I think that the we earned it in a different way or they earned it in a different way back then. And I think they really it must have sounded like magic to them. Yes, it must have sounded just like an amazing thing to hear music for that precious hour. They got to hear it. Uh huh. I agree. I know. I do wonder about that. I also wonder something else. And you can shed a light on this, I believe. What do you say about OK, I shouldn't color it with my opinion, but I can't help it. What do you say about what seems to be the enormous responsibility that an entertainer has towards the audience? Uh, it is, well, uh, it is enormous. And I've heard some entertainers, a few come to mind, I guess I'd be good not to mention their names who have uh, uh, dismissed their responsibility. I, I don't know if you know that I have a radio show that I do. Oh, I want you to talk. I do. So yeah. I'll talk about that too. And, and part of what I do on the show is we talk, I talk about the music, not just, this music is great, not just because it's my opinion, but here's why. Because that they take this chord and this chord and they put them together and it creates like a dissonance, which adds a little bit of tension and, uh, and, emo and, and you can hear the key chains go up and then our emotions go up with it. And I talk about things like that. Kind that's, of the nuts what happened, and that's what happened with that sliding into the longing ache from your uh -huh. right so oh, yeah. so there are there are combinations of notes and rhythms and chords that uh, that elicit elicit that response right yes, yes and so i think it's really good for an audience to understand a little bit about it understand well what what because i think the more you know about music the more you appreciate it and i and i do it in an oh. accessible way i don't get too pedantic you know but that is really um, that is definitely a bonus to be so do you want to tell people how we can listen to your radio show well uh the show's called fat tracks with gordon goodwin our, my logo happens to be right back there, that yellow uh, sign back there. And, and uh, right now, our home station is in San Diego, KSDS 88.3. However, we're just about to nationally syndicate, I believe, this week. Oh, good. So you'll let me know. Yeah, I'll let you know. I'm not even sure how that works, but I know there's a website. They put the show okay. up and different stations can then oh, download so it. So on the other hand, people can look you up. And then when there's a link to be able to see what you do. Yeah, yeah, there's there's a link to the to fat okay. tracks on, on my website okay. for sure. Yeah. Right. But so it, I have I, to I, tell you, Janet, it's been a doing the show, and I'm sure it's the same for you. You get on this program and you you talk to people and you you meet new people, you get new know. ideas, and it just stimulates you. Isn't it wonderful? Yes. And and for me, I'm I, I'm discovering new music. I'm looking for new people. Because a lot of times when we get older, we tend to just kind of settle back into what we know and what we like. And but now I, would I have the ranch. I would bet the ranch that that's not going to be you. Yeah. yeah. It, well, so far it's not. And the shows help me to uh, have a reason every week. Let me find a new, new something people haven't heard yet. You know, your exuberance for it all is wonderful. It's it's, oh. contagious. it's making me happy just listening to you. Now, what, now you what, said something. You said something a minute ago about luck. What? And I think that. Um, oh yes. I think that I, I've really had a fortunate life. On the other hand, you've got to know when you've got to notice when you've got the luck staring you in the face. Yeah, it's, sometimes we don't notice that we're in the, in the thick of it. Right, right. Um, I was going to ask you before, I've always had the feeling from the little I've done and know that stage fright mm -hmm. is related to that, uh, that obligation that you have to your audience to do what they have come and paid to see. That's right. And, you know? and, and it, I used to be, I used to struggle with that less like at the Hollywood Bowl and you see 70,000 people, <laughs> right. it just it just becomes a blur. But I, then I start to think, wow, the Beatles were right here and John Williams was right there and yes. uh, Ella yes. Fitzgerald was right here. And you start to you start to think about the legacy 
of who was on that stage. And it, and I've learned to use that as not a, a means of intimidation to me. I just, it makes me want to rise up to it, Good. you know, if that makes sense. Um, but that's, <laughs> listen, that's come to me fairly late in life. I didn't start the fat band until I was 40. Wow. And I, that, I that's I, important to let people know that it's never too late. It's never too late. I was working at Warner Brothers on Steven Spielberg produced animation and I was conducting these beautiful orchestras and it was great, but I didn't think it was, I, I, I would struggle a little bit thinking this isn't really what I believe in. This is what Spielberg believes in or Warner Brothers believes in. And my job was to fulfill what they wanted. And it was really great. It was world-class, but it, I finally said at 40, am I ever going to plant my flag? And I fell in love with the Count Basie Orchestra when I was 14. Maybe. And, and so I start to do the math. Well, how much is it going to cost to do a record? And will the musicians listen to me? Can I get gigs? How do you get a record deal? How do you get an agent? I didn't know any of that stuff. Um, but I, I realized that if I don't do it now, I'm not going to do it. And that's funny how that quickly that happens when you go, man, there's more road behind me than ahead. Right. But also you, you were in a position and I'm gathering that you recognize this, that the world had already said yes to you. Yeah, I'm that's you're right. Now is not screw it up. I had an infrastructure kind of more or less in place. Mm -hmm. And especially in terms of musicians, I knew the studios I could go to. And, and you know who got me the record deal? Johnny no. Mathis. Oh, nice. Okay. I, 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 had, I had our demo tape. We had like five songs done. And I sent it to him. And he goes, all right, I'm going to send it to a guy. So we sent it to a guy named Phil Ramone, who was a famous producer. He produced Billy Joel and Paul Simon. And, and Phil funny. Ramone loved it. And he sent it to uh, another guy who sent it to another guy who signed us. So, you know, Johnny Mathis set that going. And, and so oh. you're right. I was I was really fortunate that I had at least, a, you know, a phone call. And, I could and make. you knew when to say yes. I have a question about when you were talking about legacy. Yeah. Because I am about love letters and the power of letters. Are you, do you ever write letters? Have you ever? Um, less. Um, I love writing. I, I do love writing. Like um, and um, I, I think it's. I, I, bet, I think I express myself better in, in written form than I do even, you know, when we're talking. Don't have a, quite well, as many I, conversational spacers and, you know, stalls to get my thoughts together. I, um, I have a question that's kind of silly. This um, Janet Hodges, she's not here any longer with us, right? Yeah. But does she have children? Wait, wait, wait say again? Does she have children, your old piano teacher? Oh, Janet Hodges. Uh, now, I lost touch with her. And I tried to find out where she was, and I'm not sure if she's still with us or not. Um, I don't remember any kids in the house because I would I would take lessons in her house. I see. Okay, so I, my my question is, um, I love assigning homework, but I have a thought. You are an enormous part of music and entertainment history, just from what you've done. And would it feel good to you, or something you'd be even willing to do to write a series of love letters to people that is to say kind of thank you notes for what you've done and be real specific oh yes you know what you are so correct and and i've tried to make i've tried to endeavor to tell people what i feel about them well that's now while, while they're here but while if I you can. write it down and mail it yeah and there's always someone to mail it to right yeah you're that's that's really that's really a, 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 a and you know here's the other thing that i've learned as a composer mm -hmm. now i compose with a computer and I play it all in. But I started off with a pencil and a piece of paper and a piano. Yes, and yes, the yes. act of writing yes. uh, helps uh, congeal your thoughts. Oh, well, handwriting organized. handwriting letters absolutely does that. I've, I've, I understand yeah. that people in college or high school who take notes by hand learn yeah. the material. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you'll that, do that someday. Maybe, I mean, I've wanted to write a love letter to Johnny Mathis forever. Maybe I'll do one. Yes. Yeah, write it and send it to me and I'll, I'll, I'll get it to him. For sure. Yeah, because. Okay. Um, but, you know, I, I feel like journal is, journaling is lovely in any way you have of putting yeah. down. But there's something about a letter delivered to someone's mailbox, especially in an era of what we are now calling junk mail. Mm -hmm, to yeah. a real letter, the power it has. Do you and what about fan letters? Have you gotten fan letters there there? Uh, well, once in a while, I'll get a physical letter in the mail. Usually from feel? a person of a certain age, but I get a lot of email and, and of course I'm active in social media and Facebook what, and Twitter. What about, what about a real fan letter too? I mean, I've written fan letters, not often, and there has not been one that I haven't gotten a personal yeah. handwritten response to. 
Um, I, I, I get a, occasionally I'll get a, a, a physical letter from somebody. Not as, not really as much. I get, I, we, I just did a segment. It's so funny. You mentioned that on my show, we talked, I talked about answering emails and returning phone calls. Yeah. And, um, sometimes I'll have hundreds of emails a day and I'm like, I'm sure I spend all day going through them and I get requests from people. Can you listen to my record? Can you, uh, yeah. can you yeah. tell me what I, you know, about listen to my arrangement? Is it getting right. good? And if I said yes to every one of those, I right. wouldn't, you can't, I wouldn't have time. So it becomes, I, but I, I try to respond to everyone. Right. Hey, I, I, thanks for sending it. I really, uh, I, I congratulate you for writing this piece and I hope to hear it someday, time permitting all my best, at least something like that. Yeah, that's hard to do when you've got, you know, when you're in a position you are, of course, you're the person that people will turn to for help. And yes. Right. But I, I remember the people that helped me when I was that age. And I also remember the people that didn't respond. I remember those like I sent a piece to Yo-Yo Ma once. Mm -hmm. All right. And you know what I got? I back, got back a beautifully typed letter uh, saying, I really appreciate you thinking of me. This sounds like a wonderful uh, composition. Um, unfortunately, my schedule is, is wait, you know, da, 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 sure. all my best to you. Sure. And uh, that's an aberration in our business. Oh. Most of the time, a no isn't the worst answer you can get. The worst answer is just no response because right. you don't know, well, did they see it? Did they not like it? Did they, you know, and, and, um, and you can't be a new agent, right? You, you, you don't, yeah, exactly. You want to you be able to try to walk that line because right. all of us, no matter where we are on the ladder, are kind of trying to get some assistance for whoever's uh you know sure, sure. Uh, ahead of us and um and i think there's a way of going going about it that's not obtrusive or annoying right. and um but that requires the ability to kind of read read the room you know and, and read them right. that's true but you know i have a feeling that if you did those letters johnny mathis and your uh, by the way you can say you can write a letter to your piano teacher yeah you know dear i don't know what you called her um mm -hmm. Dear was Miss Hodges, Mrs. Hodges, yeah, Mrs. Hodges. I'm writing this to you, and I know it's years too late, and I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I need you to know what you have done, and then just write out the whole thing, and mail it to yourself. Do you find that 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 there's a some sort of a, a healing that happens just with the act of writing yes. it? Yes, 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 all the way. Anyway, you mail it to yourself, and don't open it. You know, Miss Janet Hodges, care of mm. you. Leave it. At the end of a year, you are going to have one heck of a book. Yeah. You know, I grat Gratitude to the people who got me where I am. Something. Yeah. No, no, I, 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 love, I love that idea. And as you say, I do have a journal and, and the journal has proven useful for me um, to be able to, because sometimes I'm a little optimistic to a fault. Uh -huh. when, my, when my 30 year marriage was crumbling and burning, oh. I was... At the time, I was like, if I work hard enough, I can fix this. That's okay. We can, you know, and, and I was, I was, uh, I, 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 my ex wife knew, women know, sure. and she knew that we had, that our connection had been severed way longer than I, than I realized it. And so, um, and she actually had to be horrible to me for, for me to wake up. Oh, you know, what, you know what? Let's, let's, if you feel like it. I've got more to ask you, and I know that we're running out of time. We are, yes, we are. But can, will you come back and talk about some more things? Absolutely. There, yeah, we even uh, we even talked about um, uh, a, a, like a significant experience I had in my twenties when I I lost a little brother to cancer, well, right. and I lost my father a month to the day later, yeah. and the impact that had on my uh, on my music, and 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 my life, and the, the lessons I learned from that. Let's from let's that talk tragedy. about. Let's do an, another love letters with that, and soon. Okay. because that's that's an enormous topic how you continue with whatever gratitude and strength you have in the face of terrible losses yeah let's do that that's a good lesson especially we all we all have that in one form or another ahead of us or it's gonna we're gonna intersect you know with, right. with, um, yes. with, oh, okay. with events let's, like that so let's do that yeah yeah okay good okay I, i'll be back to you on that meanwhile I want to thank you for doing this with me. I've just learned a lot. It went and quickly, didn't it? Yes, that's the problem. Yeah. That's the problem. <laughs> when you're talking to somebody you love talking to, it goes quickly. Yeah, it does. <laughs> well, right, you well, talk like a you talk like a jazz musician because you listen. That's a big thing about jazz. You listen to the other person and then what you say it affects what they say and vice versa. That's a real conversation. That's a real conversation. Well, you're you're just wonderful. I'm so glad we met. Thank I'm you so much. Goodbye for now.
Thank you for doing this with me. And I'm going to talk to you real soon. Okay. Thanks for having me, Jen. Appreciate it. Bye.